If you're a producer or an engineer who spends any time online whatsoever, I'm willing to bet that you've come across a certain set of audio rules and regulations and things that people take as gospel that are actually completely bullshit. They're not things that real professionals use. It's not the actual process of releasing a record. It's not exactly how you would master a record. And in this video, we're going to go over 10 rules that I see come up all the time that people get confused by, they get intimidated by, and that are just completely wrong and they're not how you actually go about the process of making a professional record. So we're going to dive in and look at those 10 rules and I'm going to debunk them for you and tell you why they're not actual rules, how they might be applicable sometimes and not applicable others. And then other than that, we're just going to break them down one by one. But my name is Austin. You're watching Make Pop Music, where we have weekly tutorials on music and music production. If you like this video, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. And after the video, if you want to support us, head over to our website, makepopmusic.com. We have tons of preset samples. We do have a start to finish production course, and we have a ton of free content over there as well that you can download. Let's jump into my computer though, and let's start looking at these bullshit audio rules. So the first rule that I want to talk about is the master to negative 14 LUFS rule. I don't know where this came from. I see so many people asking me, should I master my song to minus 14 LUFS? Should I go quieter than that? Should I go louder than that? Is it going to get limited on DSPs when I release it? And to that, I would say, I've literally never heard a single professional master that is actually negative 14 LUFS. Any time that I've ever referenced a master, whether it's Taylor Swift, Charlie Puth, the 1975, Rihanna, Drake, anybody like that, it is much louder than minus 14. Typically, when I'm mastering a pop song, I'm going for anywhere between negative six and negative eight, eight and a half LUFS. And sometimes if I'm doing hip hop or electronic, it can get all the way to like negative four LUFS. The real process of mastering is not worrying about the number, just making sure that you're getting everything sounding limited without clipping too much, you're not pumping things, and if the volume is there and it's perceived as loud, then that's perfectly fine. I do have a couple examples that I can actually show you. I'm going to try not to play too much of them so we don't get a copyright strike, but just so I can show you, here Smells Like Me by Charlie Puth, which I would consider more on the quiet side of professional mixes and masters. And let's just take a look. I'm going to mute it so we don't get a copyright, but you can see immediately we're into the negative eights, right? Short term is negative 6.5. Momentary max is negative 6.4. We even have a little bit of a true peak, probably because this is an MP3, so there wasn't some dithering. But this is a professional mix and master by the biggest mixing and mastering houses in the country. And this is what that's coming in at, like around negative seven and a half. Uh, we can even look at another example. Here's like an older example, because I know people pretend that this is like a new thing. Here's Girls by the 1975. This song is probably close to 10 years old at this point. Let's take a look. I'm going to reset it and we're immediately at negative eight, negative eight and a half. We've got momentary at negative six and a half. So you can see that these masters are not anywhere near negative 14 LUFS. If you are mastering your mix to negative 14 LUFS, you are leaving so much loudness on the table. You're leaving perceived loudness. Even if Spotify is going to turn that down and it's going to normalize all audio, which now you can turn that feature off anyway, your mix is still going to sound much pokier, much thinner, because there's not all of that compression and limiting. So if you're unfamiliar with mastering, maybe it's a good opportunity to send it out to a mastering engineer, hear what they do with it, and then maybe you can reverse engineer that for your next project. But please, please, please stop listening to the negative 14 LUFS. If anybody can provide me any top 40 song in the last 10 years that's negative 14 LUFS, please do so in the comments because I've yet to find a single one. So rule number two that I think is absolute bullshit is that all of your bass should be mono. So I hear people all the time say all frequencies below 100 or 120 hertz should be mono. Your bass should be right up the middle. Your kick should be right up the middle. And I could not disagree with that more. Sometimes that does work, especially if you're doing club music where you play on, you know, mono subs and mono systems quite a bit. But I want to show you an example of a song that has kind of like a phasey respace in it. It's Maroon by Taylor Swift. And to, you know, refrain from getting a copyright strike, I am going to turn on a pro cue. And this is also going to allow us to filter out everything below. Let's go brick wall on a linear phase below 120. That's fine. And I'm going to pull up a phase scope or a panorama just so you can see how this bass moves around. You're going to hear it and you're going to see it. Let's take a look. So you can see all that low end is moving all around. This is, again, a professional mix, a professional master, and a professional production done by one of the biggest, you know, highest paid teams in the world. This is a song that if this bass was mono and it was right up the middle, it would be so much more boring. Like if I was to take this and I was to remove, uh, you know, let's do an inverse of this. So let's just do something like this. And let's remove all of this from the sides. You 
You just you lose quite a bit of energy, especially nowadays where most people are not listening to a mono source. And if they're listening to mono, there's no low end information. It's on something like a phone speaker or you know a shitty little Bluetooth speaker. I think that making your bass mono, unless it's for something like face compatibility honestly can just waste a ton of energy and a ton of potential. You're not going to get a ton of headroom by monoing your bass. You're not going to get a ton of extra room in the mix. If anything, you're just leaving width on the table that you could be using with low end. There is a couple of videos online that talk about this specific thing in a lot more detail and they do things like use plugin doctor. I'll try to link those down below if I can remember exactly what channel they are, but don't feel like you need to make all of your bass mono all of the time. If you want a wide respace, if you want a kick that's got a little bit of width, go ahead and use it. Just make sure that it's not throwing off your perception. Make sure that it's not overcrowding your mix and make sure that that's what the song calls for. Other than that, I don't think that you need to make all of your bass mono. The professionals aren't doing it and I don't think you need to either if it's not what the song calls for. The third rule that I want to talk about the third rule that I want to talk about, yeah. The third rule that I want to talk about is leaving a certain amount of headroom when you're sending a song to get mastered. Um, so this is a song that I did for Nightbreakers, and I sent it off to Sam Moses to get mastered. And here is the pre-master I sent. So I see a lot of people saying that you need to send your pre-master not peaking above negative six or not peaking above negative twelve or whatever. Let's just take a quick listen. Again, I don't want to get a copyright strike, so I'll only show you a minute. You can see that we're peaking around negative three. So as long as you're using something inside the box, unless you're going over zero, it literally doesn't matter. Because if I sent this to Sam and it's much quieter, like let's say it's down here, so it's peaking at, I don't know, negative, what is this, like 10? So say I send it at that and it's peaking at negative 12, he can literally just clip gain it up before it starts hitting limiters or compressors or anything like that. And so depending on who the mastering engineer is, they're going to have a certain level that they like it because that's where they have their limiters and their compressors and their EQ and their multiband all set up. And as long as it's not peaking over zero and you don't have any actual clipping, literally none of that matters. So it doesn't matter if you send it at negative one peaking, negative 10 peaking, negative 30 peaking. And if you send it in 32 or 64 bit float, um, then even if you go over zero, it doesn't matter because those basically have infinite headroom anyway. So if you're sending a song to pre-master, you can always ask the mastering engineer what they prefer, but any respectable ones that I've ever talked to don't really care as long as it's not clipping and as long as it's not peaking. And then just another little thing that I'll throw in with this rule, if you're sending a song off to get mastered, only take off your master limiter. If you have two bus compression, if you have two bus EQ, if you have two bus saturation, leave all of that because that is part of your mix. The only thing that the mastering engineer should do is try to get that as loud as possible. Sometimes they're going to use EQ. Sometimes they're also going to use compression and they're always going to be using limiting. But with that said, if you have things that add to your sauce of your mix, so saturation, EQ, compression, leave that on so the mastering engineer doesn't have to try to recreate the wheel with whatever you did. They can just add their own seasonings on top. So have that discussion with your mastering engineer when you hire them. But other than that, don't overthink it. As long as it's not clipping, it, it shouldn't matter at all. The fourth rule that I want to talk about is the rule that I hear people say less is more. I often hear people talk about with production and with mis mixing that less is more. You don't need to add a bunch of things. You don't need to have a hundred tracks. And and to be honest, this is one of those things that is so different for every song. I've had mixes that I've done where I legitimately only used a couple compressors, a couple EQs, and then other than that, it was just panning and leveling. I've also had mixes that I've done that were equally as good, if not even better, where I filled up eight to 10 inserts on every single channel. I went crazy with it. I was doing tons of compression, saturation. I was adding things like modulation and flanger and chorus. And so it really just depends what the song needs. Sometimes less is more. If you feel like you're adding things just to add them or because you've seen somebody on YouTube do it or because you saw you know, Ian Kirkpatrick doing it in a live stream, Sure, maybe scale that back because that's not what the song calls for. However, if you feel like you want to keep adding stuff and it's not quite where you're wanting it, I don't think you should limit that. If I have a vocal and it needs four EQs and three DSers and some compression, and that's what I have to work with, then so be it. If I have a vocal that I only need one EQ and one DSer, then so be it. I don't think that you need to limit yourself on rules. One quick example that I want to show you of it's not necessarily less is more, it just sounds like less is more, it is a song that I produced with Joan called Nervous. So it's song number four on their new album, Super Glue. You can go check it out after the video. But when you listen to it, it sounds like a pretty simple song. It sounds like there's just some acoustic guitar, some percussion loops, and then a couple vocals. However, that song I think was probably over 200 tracks because Steven and Alan from Joan had already produced a demo. I went in and added like 60 or 70 more tracks of just ear candy, layers, filtering, all kinds of cool different stuff like that. 
that. And then I sent it back to Alan and Steven and they added some more stuff on top of it. So by the time we got to that final production and it had drums, synths, guitars, effects, vocals, sins and buses, it had to be close to 200 tracks. But the song sounds really simple. It sounds really contained. It's not super messy and super jumbled. So somebody might listen to that and they might say, yeah, this is a really simple pop song. See, less is more. However, unless you go through that project and you see every single thing that went into that, you might not understand that that production and that mix both have an insane amount of shit on it that you constantly feel in the song, but you don't necessarily hear. So we're not confusing the listener. However, we are enhancing their experience by adding some of these small little bite-sized uh, you know, effects or call and response moments or a little vocal stack to make a word or phrase seem important. So those are things that, again, you're not necessarily hearing, you're just feeling. And if you constantly live by the less is more mindset, you could be leaving quite a bit of space in your production or in your mix to add extra excitement or emotion or urgency. So make sure that you don't just get into the routine of saying like, oh yeah, if I have to use more than two EQs, it's probably not good and I don't know what I'm doing. That's not necessarily true. Do whatever you feel, use your ears, use your heart. And at the end of the day, as long as you can get it sounding how you want it to sound, it doesn't matter how you get there. The fifth and final rule that I want to talk about in this specific video, if you'll want a part two to this, let me know because there are so many other bullshit audio rules we could talk about. But the fifth one that I want to talk about is the concept of always using VU metering and using gain staging, especially inside your DAW. So we have a whole tutorial on gain staging. So if you want to see us talk about this concept for 15 to 20 minutes, I will leave a link to that video in the comments down below or we'll try to link it up here. But essentially gain staging is setting your levels so the next thing that comes in the chain is affected appropriately. So some areas of gain staging would be like when I record a vocal, like even right now for this voiceover, if I go over zero on my preamps or my converters going in, it's gonna clip. Like if I scream really loud, it might start to clip. However, if I just record this at an appropriate volume, get it into my DAW, once it's in my DAW, I can take that way past zero. Even if an individual track is showing that it's over zero, as long as this final master bus right here doesn't peak over zero, which it won't if you have something like a limiter, then you're not gonna run into uh, technically audible clipping after the fact. It's something that you can always remove. Sure, you might clip a plug-in and it might add some saturation, but all you need to do is you need to just figure out where the gain for that plug-in really performs well. So when you're gain staging in your DAW, I don't think you always need to use a V-meter. I see a lot of people say like, oh, every time I begin a mix, I get my kick sitting at like negative six on a VU meter. And then when I add my bass, it's at negative three on a VU meter. And then when I add my vocals, it's at this. And like, I feel like that's really formulaic. I feel like it can really hold people back. And sure, if you're mixing like an entire album and you have one song that you feel like is a good template, maybe you do want to use a view meter to make sure the drums in the album all kind of sit in the same spot. But other than that, I think it's really just about developing your methods and your techniques and your workflow that work well for you when you're producing or mixing. And I don't think that that necessarily has to be mixing into a VU meter, watching all of your levels, mixing with your eyes, making sure that none of your individual tracks, you know, go over zero use your kind of taste. If you want to clip things, you can clip things. It can add quite a bit of saturation and it can be a cool little effect. If you want to have really, really low levels that introduce some noise and some artifacting, that's also totally fine. But once you're in your DAW, do not overly obsess about the gain because there's basically infinite gain inside this DAW right now. The way that it processes audio is until it comes out of this master bus, unless this is over zero right here on the output, it is not going to clip your converters coming back out and it's not going to clip your the bounce. So let's say that I want to open up an 808 in uh, Vital, which I just did. You can see that right now I'm at like negative six and then it's going to go into here, which turns it down negative five. So by the time we get here, it's like negative 11. But let's say I wanted to turn this up a ton. So let's turn this up 60 B. Let's even add more gain. So this is clipping. So you can see now this is plus 6 dB. However, I'm still turning it down 5 dB on this bus, but let's turn this up too. So now we have this. Now you can hear that that introduces clipping because this master bus is going above zero. However, as soon as we add a limiter, it's going to stay below zero. You're still going to have that limiting because it's clipping this. However, all we have to do is we can turn it down here. We can turn it back down here. You can turn it down on your master bus going in. So if we added something like a compressor, we can lower the makeup gain. 
So there's tons of opportunities in your mix to make sure that you can bring that level down so it doesn't start clipping your limiter or your compressors or anything like that. But don't overly obsess with, you know, if I have a whole mix and it's rocking and I add this 808 a little bit later and to get it to sit in the mix, it starts showing a little bit yellow here. Like maybe we're, you know, peaking at plus one, plus two, plus three. As long as it's not peaking on that output, you're fine. Don't overstress it. Go watch our entire video on gain staging if this all still confuses you because we go over everything in much more detail. But I had to mention as a quick rule, gain staging inside a DAW is not anything that's like super technical. It's not super worrisome. You don't need to stress about it like everybody's going to make you feel. And that's going to do it for five audio rules that I think are a little bit bullshit. Again, some of these rules do have merit in certain situations, but I don't really think that there are any rules or formulas or cheat codes when it comes to making music. Everything is artistic. Artistic. Everything can be objective and subjective. So clipping is objective, right? You objectively go over zero, but subjectively, maybe you like the way that that sounds and that's totally fine. I don't think that you need to limit yourself with rules and regulations and formulas and templates. Just make music and if you like something, get confident in it. The confidence of creating is really what's going to make you start to not worry about these rules because once you're confident, you don't really care, right? So like I'm confident in my mix and my master. I don't care that my master comes in at negative five and a half LUFS, even though some people who have never actually met a record online are telling me it needs to be negative 14 LUFS. And again, these are rules that I've broken down throughout seven years of doing production. They're rules that I know people who have been producing for 20 years completely disregard as well. So make sure that when you take advice, you're taking it from people who actually use these things, actually do it in real time. Just kind of vet the sources because you're going to see a lot of bullshit information from you know, Facebook groups, memes on Twitter, you know, infographics on Instagram, videos on YouTube. Like I could be bullshitting you on this channel. It is your job as a viewer to take this information, filter it out, figure out what works for you, and then implement that into your own workflow. So hopefully this video helped. Again, just watch out for these five rules. If you like this video, please make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. That helps us out a ton on this channel. And if you want to support our channel, you can head over to our website, makepopmusic.com. We've got sample packs, preset packs, MIDI packs. We have a start to finish production course, and we have a ton of free content that you can download. We have free samples, free presets for Serum. There's a bunch of really, really cool stuff. So go check that out. That's makepopmusic.com. But that's going to do it for the video this week. I'll see you guys next week with much more content. Much love, everyone. Peace.